we're not going to make it. <laughs> I, in fact, I'm not even sure we're going to make it by Friday. Certainly, we would have made it by Friday if we had that one holiday. So that's probably not going to happen. Um, I think I'm still going to try and test on Friday. Today's Wednesday. That means we do a test review tomorrow. But well, that's going to be tough to do. But we'll see. So let's stay somewhat fluid on that. What I would really expect is we'll probably do the test review on Friday and test on Monday. And I generally have found that when we do that, or I do that, or set that schedule in that portion, test scores usually go down a little bit <laughs> because over the weekend nobody does anything. But uh, maybe we'll give that another, another try and see how that works. That means we would test on Monday. Now certainly we need to get going after 3D drawing. So that's going to happen early next week. So the reason the schedule is being driven a little bit is that we've changed this course quite a bit this semester and interjecting some isometric working drawings. As many, most of you are aware, we went to the welding lab, we got some data points. I want to discuss that a little bit more today on what we're doing there. So that's a new drawing for this course. Been looking for a place to get this in and finally found one. Um, so that's going to push us back a day, but I think that's, that's worth doing and we can make it up somewhere else. So that's kind of the schedule. Now, a couple other things going on is, Andy, when you run your meeting on Friday, we're going to need a committee okay. built of two people, if you would. And what it is, I mentioned we have a fundraiser, fundraiser where we work in the Expo Center. I think I mentioned the first day we were back. I expect to get that data any day. And what we need to do is update a drawing. We already have a drawing at the Expo Center and what we're doing, so it would just be editing. So one person would do the drawing on this, and it would probably take around a half hour to do. So that would be one volunteer. The other person would then be our supplies runner. Hopefully we have, a, do we have like 50 bucks of petty cash at least? Who's our uh, yeah, yeah. I think we have like 40 something. Okay, because we might have to go buy some supplies for this. What the fundraiser is, is we go lay out a floor plan on the ground of the Expo Center for Agra Action. So we chalk in spaces where all the vendors are going to be, um, and we go lay that out. And it's a nice little exercise of a little field work, and it kind of leads right into architectural and civil. So it's a good project for us, not only for a fundraiser, but for that, you get 275 bucks for it, and we got to take supplies out of that. So usually we make 200 to 50 somewhere in that zone. Um, the whole class goes on that day. Usually it'd be next Tuesday. If we get started about 8:30, 9 o'clock, we'll probably be done around 11, 11:30. Doesn't take us that long, especially with a class this big. Last year's class we had five of us total at, at this point, and it took us two and a half hours. So we should be a little quicker this year. I yes. Have a quick question, uh, County. If we don't get the money until the end of the semester, what good does that do us right now? I mean, I'm we, sorry, we can't, can we use this, the, the 270 we get for a fundraiser for doing that? They won't account until the end of the semester. How do you? How do you? Get no, we get this from KMBT. This is not with CSI. Oh. KMBT is oh. hiring okay. us to go later. Right. So are that they gonna right. like just give us cash or check? They send us a check. Oh nice. wow. And so you do have to send it down through there, so it's gonna get tax but uh, that's the way it works yeah okay oh fun um, it's just yes. chalk that we need as supplies um, that water. paint I've still got string for pulling everything so we don't need to do that class a couple of years ago we went and bought a I think a roll of baling twine so we still got enough of that to do it do you have I any think. kind of equipment to run it the chalkers, the chalkers, yeah. we got hand power. How many of you worked for the parks department growing up? Anybody? Oh, yeah, the <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you're probably good at the chalker. We'll put Beck on the chalker. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I've worked as part. Yeah, I've done that. But, but it's a good exercise trying to stay square and figuring diagonals and you know how these all work. So um, that will happen, I think, next Tuesday. I haven't gotten the data yet. So one person do the drawings, get them updated so that we got something to work off of. It'll be a floor plan type of drawing and then one person to run, grab supplies for the other. So please okay. ask for volunteers on that. Um, the other thing is I got a call last night. CSI is running a construction course for people outside in the work development that want to know some basics of construction. They're going to build a bunch of little sheds and donate them to 
vet veterans around the area. They need some floor plans, roof plans, elevation, and stuff like that for this little bully barn type of thing that they're doing. So um, maybe if we can get two or three people to volunteer to do that. Um, I don't know all that information. Okay. Just get with me if you want to be in on it. Chris Udy, a uh, prior graduate of this program, called this morning. He's in charge of it. Where is he from? He's working over in Jerome. Um, so he's going to be in charge of it and send us the sketches and stuff for us to work off. So we'll put that together. We need to put them in a working drawing format so that a bunch of people will show up that know nothing about construction and they're going to build these things and then donate them to vets around the area that have disabilities. So it's a pretty cool deal. Yeah. Neither, neither one of these really pay per se. One's a fundraiser. The one that's the bully barns is just kind of to help out. It doesn't really pay. But it'll give you a real life experience. We'll run through all the drawings, I think, except for the foundation plan. Would that, that be necessary. Would that be an in-class thing? Or no, it'd be outside of class. Outside class. So please, if you are just barely keeping up with stuff, don't volunteer for this stuff. Don't do it. School always comes first. Always. Okay, you can learn this stuff in, the, in later. Okay, certainly, we're going to hit architectural later. You'll know all this stuff later. The people that volunteer for like the Bully Barn, you're going to have some stuff outside of class you need to do on these. Okay, so if you got work or things like that and you're just barely keeping up, don't volunteer for this. Okay, but if you're a little bit ahead or you think you have the time to do it, sure, jump on into it. It'll give you some real life experience. Okay. Um, so give it a little thought. Get with me if you want to be involved with the Bully Barn. Let's see, so there's that. Um, what we're going to do today, I handed a handout to you. It's out of an older text. I just want to real quickly review that. Um, what I'd like you to know out of that, certainly not the whole thing. So, there's a lot of pages there. I copied it as a reference for you because it's not really in your text. Most of the stuff is still pertinent, although some of the paths to do things have been changed a little bit. So I'm just going to review that real quickly. I will give examples of what those do in tomorrow's lecture. Okay. So you're not to spend a ton of time in that thing. Just when you get need a half hour break, jump into it and look at something new. Okay. I want to talk about the two drawings we're currently working on this morning and what we expect for those. So I want to lie lay out the requirements for your one-line piping drawing and then I also want to draw the basics of your house. I want to give you a couple pointers of doing a perspective of this magnitude and all I'm going to do is just the body of the house. It won't take us very long. Um, I'm not planning on you drawing along with me, just kind of seeing what I do. And then I'm going to grab the last group. We're going to head over to the welding lab. We're going to get your data and then we'll come back and then somewhere around 11 o'clock I'll pick back up and I'll draw the rest of the house because the roof is really the part that is the struggle on it. So hopefully everybody's got enough time to put together the body of the house and we get to the roof this afternoon. You'll see how that is done. Right? Or later this morning, not Saturday. So in essence, that's what we got planned for today. Any questions? Thoughts? Comments? Okay, in essence, in this handout I gave you, there's two chapters here. So I put it all yours in one handout. I've got mine broken into two. Chapter 31 is object linking and embedding. What you need to know here is just how to access it. It's off the insert ribbon now. This was done before ribbons came out, this text. It's the last place I could find documentation on this stuff. What this is for is a lot like X-Repping. When we X-Rep, we actually link to other drawings, right, so that we can see them and use them. This is the exact same process, but it's meant for other items, like Word documents, Excel spreadsheets, things like this. And yes, we do these all the time. They're the only real difference is it, do you put them into paper space or model space? Most firms actually link Word documents or Excel documents into paper space because it comes in without scaling regardless, right? It's one to one. Therefore, you can set your text at eighth inch high in like Word and it still reads fine and that you do not have to take into account your scaling. So in essence, try and figure out in here just how to access it and link a Word document or an Excel spreadsheet. Um, those are the two biggies. Now, why do we do those? Word documents, great typing, right? Do we do tables and stuff? Think of coordinate dimensioning. Okay. Think of door schedules, window schedules. We've mentioned them. I don't know that you've really looked at one yet. 
We do a lot of tables that give location, give size, give materials, things like that. And they're much easier to do in some of these other programs that are available to us, much faster. So we can link those in. That's what you need to know out of here, and that's it. Okay. So that's this one, is how you take external programs like Word and Excel and attach those documents to a drawing. Okay. That really won't take you a whole lot. Okay. Now, I'm not going to go over Word and Excel that much. That's something you just kind of need to know on your own. I will hit Excel and Civil Drafting quite a bit because we use a lot in there. So if you're unfamiliar with Excel, then we'll do a little bit of that when we hit Civil. Um, now, I'm fairly confident in all those programs, so if you have no idea what they are, you can get with me and I'll give you a quick tutorial. Um, the second one is Chapter 32. This one's a little more important as far as your drawings go. This one we do quite a bit of. Not everything you'll use is in here. There are some new tools that are available in Windows, like the program called Snippet. Um, and the yeah, all print screen, control print screen, what do these things do? They're not really in here, but I'll cover some of these shortcuts. In essence, how do we put pictures in our drawings? And we're doing this a lot now, especially in location maps, like site plans, like where is this piece of property located? It's real easy to jump onto Google Earth, get zoom into an area where you see this plot of land, snap a picture of it off your screen, throw it into CAD and draft over the top of the picture. Right. And it works quite well. It, in addition to that, sometimes if we want a pictorial view of something, and we don't want to take the time to draw a perspective or an isometric, but you have the physical object, what would stop you to just grab the thing, set it on a piece of cloth, take a picture with your camera, and throw it in as a view with your multi-views? Still does the same thing, right? Visualization. In essence, you're creating some of these. So this one really has more pertinence in Chapter 31 even for us. It's how we deal with pictures. Now, I will tell you there's a couple commands in here you will want to look at. And I'm just going to real quickly kind of highlight them. So on Chapter 32, find that section, that's it. Certainly, I think you want to give this chapter a little more work. Page 878. Attaching raster images. By raster, we mean pictures. Okay. Go through that one. You can see down on the bottom of that page that it's done through x now. And this is still the same way it's done. So that will allow you to get into it. So page 878. You should look at that one and however far that goes. Looks like it goes to 881. Then, as you come through to 882, Know the image frame command. This one's pretty valuable to you working with pictures. Image frame. And, and it has to do with how it plots. Following that on 883 is the image clip command. This is just like clip in any other picture editing program. It's how we can kind of take certain parts of it out or in and display it. So you should know that one. Which one was that? Uh, image clip. So you need image frame on 882, image clip on 883. Now all of these commands are available and through the properties dialog box, which is on 885. So that's really probably the best place to get to them. Just make sure you understand how the properties work. If you need a picture, if you don't have one, those of you that have phones, take a picture of your desktop or something and email it to yourself. Again, please do not download them off the internet. If you need a picture, you can also call me and I'll throw maybe a couple fun ones out on Google Classroom and you can use those. Now, following that from 886 through 886 and 887. Here's a bunch of good pictures. Uh, picture creating commands. So this is save image, BMP out, JPG out, PNG out, TIFF out. Those are nice commands to know. Now certainly they all work the same. It depends on the file format that you wish. 
But just as a quick example, I'm going to look at 887. On here, you have JPG out, PNG out, and TIF out. Now, I'm not going to get into all the <coughs> specifics of these. If you really want to know how to edit pictures, you should take Photoshop 101, and it would go over all of these. Some of you have already had that stuff. But what's a JPEG? Okay. Does anybody know what a JPEG is? Okay, it's a picture like your phone takes. They all have an extension JPG. Now the things you really got to know from as a drafter is a JPG is an uneditable picture. Okay, so in essence, you can't really do anything with it. Which ones are uneditable? J JPEGs. Oh, JPEGs. Okay. PNG, this is a Photoshop picture. By this, if you take a Photoshop picture, it's going to go to Photoshop, but what it does is it retains all the layers retains all the line weight so you can edit this photograph okay, so you can work with it and it's meant specifically for Photoshop so if I was going to take a, a 3D model I would take a picture of it using PNG out ship it into Photoshop and really dress it up nicely because you can do a lot in Photoshop you can't do in CAD. Then the tip out is a lot like a PNG it retains all the layers so it's editable that it goes into many editing programs like Corel Draw or Photoshop or any of these will deal with it. And again, this one's editable. Now, the memory on these is what the issue is, and, but it's nice to know where these are at. Okay. Um, anybody dealt with 3D Studio Max or 3D Viz before? Some of you have? Okay. These are all Autodesk products now. They bought out the companies that do them, and they're all like 3D Studio Viz is actually a 3D animation program. It takes tips and you can edit in there. Studio Max is when you watch cartoons like uh, The Incredibles 2, great movie by the way. Oh yeah, a lot of that super was cute. Was done in 3D Studio Max okay? and a lot of drafters use it for that. Um, gaming uses this, so those of you that like to sit on a console and shoot people or something like that, they, a lot of that was probably done in 3D Studio Max okay? and, and we can export right into it with those formats. Um, so anyway, that's just kind of what that's about. Just kind of look over and know why and you're good to go. I don't know that we really need the rest of this chapter. Oh, there's a PDF thing. That, that's pretty nice. And that starts on 893. Now, many of you, have, and we went over it in class, we can make a PDF in AutoCAD. How do we do it now that you've been shown how? Does anybody remember? Don't you export it from one file to another? Um, you can, but that's not the way I showed you earlier. You just click on it and change it to PDF. No. You export it? You do it through the plot window. Remember choosing the DX DWG to PDF plotter. Oh. You do it through the plot window. And that one's the safer one, but here's another way to do it here. And PDFs are really kind of a, a good way to share information between firms. The DGN stuff at the end, you do not need to really deal with that. That's going into MicroStation, which is AutoCAD's main competitor. So there's kind of a quick synopsis of what you should look at in those chapters. So everything in chapter 31. No, not really. Just know, just know how to open it. Just know how to open it and edit it. And it's pretty quick. I mean, you find the little insert button, you slap it in there. And how do you edit it? Double click it. <laughs> there, I covered chapter 31. <laughs> not quite true. There's a little more than that. Why don't we do my hand in the front lights? Um, those of you that have had a chance to work on this, you might have noticed a couple things that are really kind of a, a pain with doing a perspective of this size. Because keep in mind, this is a fairly big object, right? It's 60 feet long. It's um, what, almost 15 feet high, a little bit bigger than what we've normally worked with with our little mechanical widgets that we're dealing with that are a couple inches, right? Then when we do that, you end up finding out a couple things. One, that due to the location of these, 
and the lines you get, you end up kind of deleting those things, and specifically these. And you might delete them accidentally, and then you get three steps down, so where's that dang line at? No, oh, wait, I deleted it, now I gotta undo back to it. Additionally, how many of you are finding that to draw in here? If I want to snap to vanishing point right over here, I'm doing a ton of zooming. I mean, that middle mouse wheel is just constantly flexing. But a couple tricks that you might want to do to save you a lot of work is use some layer options. Okay, so by that, when you come into this drawing and I do these big ones, I always make myself a layer that I'm going to put stuff on and I'm going to lock that layer. And I kind of went into this the other day. So I'm just going to create a new layer here. And I'm just going to call it my locked layer and give it a color, whatever I want. I'm not going to print this layer. Okay, so I really don't care what the line weights are or the line types. Okay, all I need is just to put it on that layer. Now, when I create it, if I lock it immediately, I can't put anything on it. Okay, so don't lock it right away until you put the items you want on it. So now I've created it. There's my locked layer. And now what I'm going to do is take my three planes. Okay, so my picture plane, ground line, and horizon line and put them all on that layer. Right now they sit on the phantom layer, so I'll put them unlocked. And I also, I'm not going to move these points, my station point and my vanishing points, so I'm going to put them on them also. That way I can never delete these things. And use whatever color you want. This color shows up good on the projector, so I use it. Now, one other thing I would recommend that you do, and this will save you a lot of time, is create yourself some snap lines. Now, way back when we did drafting 132, they had a couple construction lines that can work for here. And it was, I think, in chapter four, I believe, of your AutoCAD text. And it was the X line and the ray. Now, I went into them real quick and just said, hey, you're probably not gonna use these a whole lot, so just go over them once and then don't use them. I still don't use them here, but they're a pretty valuable tool for it. Now, what I'm gonna do is just basically draw myself a construction line I'm gonna leave forever, but I'm gonna make sure that the thing has to use one snap. So how I'm gonna do this is I'm just gonna take a line and I'm gonna come from vanishing point right and I'm gonna get a long ways away from this guy. Now, what I wanna do is make sure that if I've got a midpoint snap, it won't engage in this area. I want only the endpoint to engage. So I'm gonna make this thing really, really long. And I'm gonna come somewhat through my area. So I drew that line. Notice I come through the top here, so it won't be on my drawing. My drawing should be right in this area. My line's a little bit above it. Now, the midpoint's clear over here, approximately. So therefore, if I'm trying to snap right here, only the endpoint will engage. Do so you kind of see how that works? Let me get even a little further away just to kind of force that. I'll make this thing really long. So somewhere out about here. Now I'm going to do the same thing from vanishing point left. So I'll come down, take a point from vanishing point left, and I'm going to make a really long line that comes in there, and then I'm going to put both of these lines on that locked layer. So I'm looking like that. Ah, that one I don't like. I gotta unlock my layer now. Because you, you aren't, well, it's not locked yet. Okay. So that guy, I want to come a little bit more up with this guy. Does it matter where they fall? No, I just want them a little bit outside of my area. Okay. So right in here is fine. Now I can see due to the angle that whenever I'm on this line, my endpoint will always snap to here. Whenever I'm on this, this line, my endpoint will snap over there. Now I'm going to go ahead and lock these. Put this on that lock layer, and then lock the layer. So that this can't be edited. Now I'll still see them, right? They're still on the drawing, but I can't see them. Now let me just real quickly show you why that's pretty nice. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and start this. Now I've got true size right here. Okay, so I'm going to bring that down to the ground. And then I, once I'm on the window, I can come over here and get my wall height. Now my wall height goes right to this line right here where my...